Hi, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us this week on our 1115 Philips Security Research Morning Call for the 22nd of August. Today, we'll be covering quite a few stock counters, as well as some technical analysis on a few stocks and ending it off with our Singapore Weekly for our macro sector outlook. Without further ado, I'd like to hand over the time to Max to talk about C Limited. Thanks, Sean. So, C announced the result for the first half of 2022. The company recorded a revenue of 2.9 billion US dollars, which is uh, around 42% of our FY22 forecast, and a net loss that was worse than the expected at 79% of our forecast at 0.9 billion dollars. So, for the positive, um, for C is that its growth drivers are still performing well. Shopee grew 51% year on year, with growth order, order going up by 42%. Shopee also generated more international ex-China sales revenue than e-commerce giants uh, Alibaba. The adjusted EBITDA loss per order for Shopee before HQ cost was below one cent, which improved 95 percent year on year, with expectations that it would it is still on track to turn positive by year end. C money also grew 240 percent year on year because of the increased synergy with Shopee. The total pay payment volume was up 36% and the quarterly active users grew 53% as well, with around 40% 40, 40 of buyers on Shopee using C-Money products. However, C ended the first half of the year with a wider than expected net loss, growing 115% year on year due to higher expenses. Both GNA expense and R&D expense doubled. For GNA expense, it jumped 96% mainly due to higher allowances for credit losses from C-Money. While the R&D increase in R&D expense was because of the increasing headcount growth due to expansion of tech capabilities. In addition to that, the company also recorded 177 million US dollars goodwill impairment. C also suspended Shopee revenue guidance for FY22, with its original guidance standing in the range of uh, 8.5 to 9.1 billion US dollars. The suspension was mainly attributed to the increasing volatility and continued micro uncertainties as well as the company's shift uh, towards focusing on efficiency and optimization for the long term. Moving on to the outlook, uh, we expect Garena to continue its year on year decline, uh, partly because of the continued uh, decline in player base. Quarterly paying users was down 39% year on year and 9% quarter on quarter. And this is also coupled with the fact that there's, there's limited number of games in their pipeline. The gross profit margin for Shopee will uh, continue to improve sequentially quarter on quarter. Therefore, we expect unit economics for Shopee to continue to improve moving forward, particularly with the growth from the higher margin items like advertising revenue and transaction-based fees. The expectation for so Shopee is also to gradually increase its take rate in mature pub markets moving forward to grow margins. As for C-Money, the adjusted EBITDA loss was uh, narrowed by 28% year on year, mainly due to the increase, increase in both QAU and TPV. We expect that by leveraging on its synergies with Shopee, C Money will continue to tap on a vastly underserved market to grow its user base. Overall, we lower our FY22 revenue forecast by 6% to reflect the weaker than expected e commerce growth in the near term due to FX segments and uh, micro uncertainties. And we increased our net loss forecast by 42% to reflect higher expenses attributed to R&D and GNA, and the higher tax expense as well. We maintain a buy with a lower target price of 110 US dollars from the previous 150, with the rate of 7.6% and a growth rate of 2%. With that, I hand over the presentation to Glenn. Hey, thanks, Max. So SGX recently announced their full year 22 uh, results. So a quick overview of their results. Um, the FY22 revenue full year of 1.1 billion was slightly below our estimates at 94% of our estimates. While earnings of 452 million met our estimates at 99%. The variance for the revenue came from lower than expected equity revenue due to lower treasury income. The full year 22 dividends was stable at 32 cents. So just a few uh, brief highlights is that the fixed income and their data connectivity in revenue grew 19% and 3% per year on year respectively. And this was led by an increase in their OTC FX revenue and an increase in the data and subscri services subscriptions. 
So excluding treasury income, revenue was up 7% year on year, driven by higher derivatives volumes across equities, currencies, and commodities. Their equities cash and derivatives for revenue was 4% higher year on year as higher trading and clearing revenue was offset by lower treasury income due to the lower net yield. So for the positives, the first positive is that their new businesses accelerated the growth. And with the acquisition of Max Trader in January of this year, SGX's OTFX pillar, which includes BitFX, Max Trader, and Electronic Communication Network, average daily volume grew 64% year on year to 70.6 billion US dollars with a target of 100 billion US dollars in the medium term. And this contributed about 55 million sing, sing dollars or 5% to their full year 22 revenue. So consequently, their fixed income and DCI uh, data connectivity revenue grew 23% and 3% respectively to boost revenue growth. Both businesses are expected to remain growth engines for SGX with opportunities from cross-selling and new client acquisitions on the back of customer access to an enlarged trading network. For the second positive, their underlying business remain resilient. And if we exclude treasury income, revenue grew 7% year on year, lifted by higher trading and clearing revenues from equity derivatives, currencies, and commodities. Treasury and other revenue income dropped as treasury income was affected by lower yields from the low interest rates. For the third positive is that the yeah, FTSE China A50 and Nifty 50 contracts continue to grow. Even despite the introduction of their Hong Kong exchanges MSCI China A50 Connect Index in October of 2021, SGX's FTSE China A50 contracts saw increased volume with growth of 9% year on year. SGX expects trading activity and open interest of the FTSE China A50 contract to continue growing as the international A share market expands. SGX's Nifty 50 contract also showed increased volume and grew 14% year on year. So moving on to the negatives, there's one negative is that their equities cash revenue and treasury income dipped. So the equities cash revenue was 6% lower year on year, and this was mainly due to corporate actions and other revenue dipping 14% and trading and clearing revenue decreasing 9% as the daily average traded value total traded value, and overall average clearing fees declined. On the equities derivatives side, the treasury revenue was down 50% to 28.6 million. And this was mainly from treasury, a dip in treasury income, which declined primarily due to lower net yield. Nonetheless, this was offset by an increase of 22% in trading and clearing revenue, as equity derivatives volume increased 4% and higher fees per contract of $1.51 cents in full year 22 as compared to $1.34 in FY21. So overall, the equities revenue was stable year on year and accounted for about 64% of revenue. For the outlook, the continued development of multi-assets uh, is to, to anchor long-term growth and SGX remains committed to expanding its suite of products through strategic partnerships and new product development for newly acquired businesses. They are also investing for the medium term and SGX has guided for full year 23 expenses to grow 7 to 9% from FY22. And this includes a 2% growth from the full year impact of the acquisition of Max Trader. The higher expenses, expenses sorry, are mainly from the build out of their OTC FX business and higher staff costs from salary increments. Thirdly, there's also rising interest rates. And apart from the banks, SGX is another beneficiary of the higher interest rates, and treasury income is expected to recover with the rising interest rates. With management, with SGX's management mentioning that the low treasury income is to remain for the following months, with only an uptick expected later in the year. As such, we upgrade to a buy with a higher target price of $11.71. Our target price remains pegged to a plus two standard deviation of its five-year mean or 26 times PE. The catalysts for SGX include continued growth from their new acquisitions, as well as higher trading, higher treasury income as the economic conditions improve. So that's all I have for SGX. I'll now hand it over to Darren. Uh, thank you, Glenn. So we issued an update report on Escort Residence Trust. So our title is a strong recovery in ref file. So as you can see on the left side, we have three graphs. Uh, one of it is a ref file change year on year, and one of it shows the portfolio recovery and the occupancy. So our investment thesis for this is that there was a strong recovery in portfolio REFA. The average daily rate was well, up 50% year on year in second quarter 22 and occupancy is at 70% compared to 
one year ago, which was at 50%. So the second quarter 22 wrap up for US, UK, SG and AU were at 8697-96% of pre-COVID levels. So all these three countries are almost recovering to their pre-COVID levels. While there is a little bit of drag in China and Japan, which are still uh, a little bit far off from their pre-COVID levels. The standard stay segment remains resilient with 95% occupancy comprising of about 20% of the first half 22 gross profit. So this standard stay segment is like the, the uh, rental houses and uh, the PBSA. So for the purpose-built student accommodation in the US, their pre-leasing is about uh, over 95% and we expect a rental growth of about 8%. For so the next point, there's a high profit uh, Escort has a high proportion of debts that are at fixed rate, 79%, which are locked in for about three years. They also have a low effective borrowing cost of 1.7%, and we did some calculations that about a 25% change in interest rate would have about a 1% impact on DPU. So for the outlook, uh, Escort uh, just issued a private placement of 170 million, and the price is at 1.12 Singapore dollars. So this uh, 170 million is going to start uh, trading on the stock market on the 24th of August. So that is a uh, two days time. So because of this uh, private placement, there will be a little bit of drag in the near term for the share price. So this placement was done to partially fund a proposed acquisition, acquisition of service residences in France, Vietnam, Australia, rental housing properties in Japan, a student accommodation property in South Carolina, US. And this proposed acquisition would increase the proportion of their longer stay assets allocation from 17 to 19%. Uh, this will this is in line with their target to have a 25 to 30% asset allocation in this uh, service uh, in this uh, longer stay assets in the near term and with a 37.5% debt head, uh, gearing which means a debt headroom of $1.8 billion for them to acquire more assets in this uh, uh, longer stay assets. So with this, we maintain and accumulate with an change target price of $1.24 for escort. Uh, no change in our forecast. And the management guided that all bookings indicate sustained pent-up demand and with more corporate and international travel returning. So just a gauge like they said, from their assets about 10% of their tourists are from China. So right now, the China tourists are still missing. So once the China open up and then this 10% comes back, then it will benefit them a lot. So the potential reopening of China and Japan to leisure travel are also by Scott. And next slide, please. So last week, we had a few on the ground for first week. It was a poems a webinar. So for first week, uh, they have a market cap of about 175 million and is they are primarily a healthcare read with assets in Indonesia, Japan and Singapore. So Indonesia, their assets are mainly hospitals, Japan and Singapore are nursing homes. They completed an acquisition of 12 Japan nursing homes on March, on 1st March 22. For their first half 22 results, their rent and other income were up 38.2%, mainly because of the contribution from the 12 Japan nursing homes that they uh, acquired on the 1st of March and the restructured master lease agreements for 14 hospitals in Indonesia with a minimum 4.5% annual escalation. So for this uh, restructured master lease agreements, they will be receiving their revenue main, uh, in Indonesian rupiah. So for their first read 2.0 strategy, they have a target to have a 50% of their MPI in developed markets. Uh, for example, uh, Japan, Australia, UK, Europe and US within the next five years. Right now, it's at 11.9%. They have a long wheel of 13 years and they're looking to divest their hotel and country club property, which lease expires December 22. They've been trying to divest this for quite some time. So um, this lease is on a yearly renewable basis until they can divest. They were gearing of 35.6% and their all-in cost of debt is 3.7% interest coverage ratio 5.6% and they are negotiating to finance refinance their term loan due in March 23rd. They are divesting their Siloam Hospital Surabaya at a premium of 143% and 
over the original purchase price. And this reaps capital gains an opportunity to recycle a mature asset instead of taking on excessive development risk. So a bit of history on this is that um, they own the old building. This old hospital was developed in about uh, 1970s and then they issued and then they uh, went into a joint agreement with Lipo Karawachi to build a new hospital and then it's like an uh, asset swap. But then while they were building the hospital, the, the road to the hospital, the, there was a sinkhole and road, road subsidence. So because of that, they were compensated 30.6 million for some of the expenses and additional costs incurred. And for the outlook of first read, they are in talks to acquire more Japan homes by the end of the year and at a price to NAV of 0.83 times and a 9.4% annualized dividend yield, it does seem attractive. But then right now, because of their master lease agreements, most of their revenue is in Indonesian rupiah. So a lot of, you, you basically, you buy first week, you are having an exposure to Indonesian rupiah. But then the good thing is that they have a 4.5 annual escalation to kind of cover this uh, Indonesian rupiah exposure. So with that, I hand over the presentation to Terence. Great. Thanks, Darren, and good morning, everyone. Uh, Samco Industries reported first half 2022 profits that beat expectations because of higher conventional and renewable energy uh, profit. For first half of 2022, conventional energy grew 115% uh, and renewable energy grew 227% on a year-on-year basis. Uh, the first half 22 profit was also lifted by a one-off hedging gain of $92 million uh, from gas hedges. Samcorp Industries currently still have gas hedges, but we don't expect this one-off uh, hedging gain of $92 million to be repeated uh, for the second half. The second positive is that the group also reaffirmed their battery segment as a key growth driver for the medium to long term. The battery segment was flagged as a key growth driver in line with its uh, during the analyst day in 2021. It currently has 120 megawatts of energy storage in the UK and is currently in the process of building a 360 megawatt battery factory in Tayside, UK. The outlook for the battery segment remains positive, uh, mainly because of the UK's move towards renewables, which will uh, require a stronger battery backup as they, they, they gradually move towards renewables. Renewables profit was strong at 74% of our full year 22 estimates. Uh, this was lifted by better performance and its recent acquisition. The uh, better performance in better wind resources, rather in India and higher spot prices for its solar business in Singapore lifted overall profits. Uh, its acquisition of a 98% stake in the Chinese HYNE assets will also contribute $50 million per year to its profits. And we've uh, uh, incorporated this into our second half results. In terms of the negatives, lower land sales uh, was dragged its integrated urban solutions business. Uh, having said that, management remains confident of hitting its target of 500 hectares of land sales by financial year 25. They are currently in the midst of uh, developing two Vietnamese sites. In terms of outlook, the management continued to guide for the conventional energy segment to perform well in the second half of this year uh, as the global energy markets remain firm. Having said that, we part down our second half 22 revenue expectations uh, as, as uh, USAP prices have actually trended lower in July of this year. In terms of our recommendation, we maintain neutral with a higher target price of $3.27. Uh, this was up previously from $2.96. Uh, we raised financial year 22 pet me by 86% as we bake in higher profits from conventional energy and renewable energy for the first half of 2022. Our target price is still packed to 1.2 times financial year 22 uh, price to book. So that's all for me. I'll hand over the time to Zin. Uh, thanks, Darius. So I'll be covering the technical power segment. Uh, next slide, please. So the first talk we'll be covering is uh, sets limited. So we initiate a technical buy at $4.07 with the first target price at $4.40. The second target price is at $4.70 and the stock loss is at $3.88. So the stock last closed at uh four twelve as of Friday. So we believe that a retest of the immediate support at four dollars to four dollars and ten cents is possible before the price edge higher. This is because there was a neckline breakout of a inverted head and shoulder pattern at four dollars and seven cents, which points towards a bullish upside. 
Twice has also been supported by an uptrend with a bullish rejection candles along the way, forming a series of higher lows confirming the uptrend. Thus, price could reach the resistance zone at $4.25 to $4.40 before making a possible retest of the support zone and head towards $4.55 to $4.70 thereafter. Next slide, please. So the next stop will be uh, Bank of America. So this is a technical buy at $33.90 with the first target price at uh, $44 and the second target at $50. The stop loss is around $32 and the stock last close $35.48. So similarly, we believe that a retest of the immediate support at $33 to $34.30 is possible before the price continues to edge higher. So this is because there was a breakout of this bullish uh, falling wedge pattern which points towards an upside. Uh, price has also been supported by a higher low cons consolidation range form after the breakout which confirms the reversal of a downtrend. Uh, price could reach the first resistance zone at $36.50 to $39 before making a possible retest of the support zone and head towards the next resistance zone at $42 to $44 and, also, and reach uh, $48 to $50 thereafter. Next slide. So the last stock I'll be covering is uh, Franken Group. So this is a technical buy at $1.14. The first target price is $152. And the second target price is one eighty. The stop loss is a uh, one dollars and five cents, and the last stock last close at one dollars and fourteen cents last Friday. So, uh, we believe there's a potential bullish reversal to the upside because there was a formation of this uh bullish double bottom at one dollars and six cents, and price has been making a series of higher highs and higher lows, and while being supported by this uh this uptrend uh support line which confirms the reversal of a downtrend. Price could reach the first recent zone at 143 to 152 before heading towards the next recent zone at 166 to 180 thereafter. So that's uh, all I have for me now. Uh, if you want more technical analysis, you can follow us on uh, technical pause at stock PMB. I'll now be passing my time to Paul to cover the rest of the stock and uh, SG briefly. Uh, okay, thanks, uh, thanks Zin. Um... Uh, for QNM results, I think um, the key thing was it was being it was hurt by by upfront costs and also uneven bonus provision. So when when you look at the the results, the results was below expectations. Uh, revenue was in line around fifty two, uh, but the PME was about 40 percent of our full year forecast. So what happened was they they are ad, uh, taking on additional costs from AI project, which I'll elaborate later, uh, and also. Uh, recognition of bonus provisions. This, this is a bit more unusual bonus because typically most companies, you know, when you have bonus provision, you allocate it evenly. So in the past, they only did it in the fourth quarter, but right now they are starting to do it in the second quarter. So the, a year ago, you didn't have this provi bonus provision and then this year you have it now. Uh, the main, the headline number where you see on the table on the left, the profit drop uh, was about 60% was because the the COVID-19 business under their subsidiary uh, acumen uh, song from a profit of 3 million to a loss of 50,000. So you you miss this, so you uh, you lost this 3 million of profit because, it, because no one is doing PCR testing now, I guess. Uh, in terms of the positive, uh, they opened eight clinics. This is one of the highest uh, on, on record. The previous record was also eight clinics a few quarters ago. Uh, year on year, this is they, they, they increase the number of dental clinics to by twenty percent. Um, so they so far is tracking our our estimate of about twenty five. Uh, but the worry was that despite the rise in clinics, I mean, when your clinics jump twenty uh nineteen percent, you should expect no revenue to maybe move in line. But when we look at the dental only revenue, it only rose five percent. It's not on the table on the left. So what it means is that the revenue per average clinic was down, partly because now these are new clinics, so it takes time take time to mature. Uh, the second negative was the, you can see on the table on the left, the employee cost was up, even though revenue was down. Uh, one of it is because of the provisioning. Uh, and also, they take on the additional AI project, which is essentially headcount. You, know, you need to hire software, and, um, people from the software and so forth. Another mini minor point is that they, because Acumen invested in new equipment as they move into new business. In terms of the outlook, I think the investment into the AI will continue. So this, this additional uh, 1 million of expenses will be seen in the second half. 
uh, the revenue per clinic should improve as they mature. So what is this AI software about? So they receive uh, approval of, from HSA as a class B medical device. So basically this software is to be, first stage is to get approval of course, second is to roll it out in all the QMM uh, dental clinics. It's, the software is supposed to be provide independent advice. Because if you go to any dentist right now, I mean, depending on what they like to do, what they are so very good in, please don't quote me, but uh, they, there's, I guess people are a bit worried how independent is their advice or dental plan. So with this AI, uh, it will give a more independent AI plan and so forth. And ultimately, the aim is to roll this across Singapore and earn uh, income from this. So, so that will take some time, but I think they're taking on this cost. For acumen, of course, PCR testing is hardly done. I think maybe if you go Japan or maybe Korea trip, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, apart from, so they are focusing now on other types of screening, such as sepsis, colon, and pharmacogenetics, which is uh, to decipher your gene genes to see whether you can take on certain medicine and so forth. Uh, we, we, we maintain a buy, but we cut our target price because we are lowering our pet me. Uh, uh, mainly because of the higher cost, our revenue is intact, but because of this additional cost, we said we had to take down our uh, target price. Uh, in terms of the outlook, and this 2022 will be a transition year for the company. They're going to take on a lot of this uh, upfront cost uh, and, and also roll out more clinics and also acumen periods of it. But the main thesis for us, why we still like QNM is just the whole dental franchise. Uh, they are continued. We, we always want them to aggressively roll out the franchise because they only have 10% market share in Singapore. But you will take some upfront pain because not all clinics are going to perform the same level as the mature ones. Uh, next slide. So for Netlink, which is which provides fiber to residential and, and certain offices, the, the results was uh we are always say a smooth fast because which is supposed to be their strength because they're not meant to be volatile. Uh, the results was basically in line revenue and EBITDA. Uh, you see a, a better pickup in revenue uh, because of diversion revenue because construction activity was uh, virtually stand still last year for them. So right now, diversion is basically you know when you have a maybe a new when. The authorities want to move roads or they need to, to, to kind of dig roads kind of, or lay new cables, then they will ask them to do it and, and they'll, they get this kind of uh, revenue. Uh, the positives was that residential connections, which accounts for most of the profit uh, increase, it used to be a year ago was 4,000, now it's 12,000 and so forth. Uh, the negative is a bit small. This is a small item. So, I mean, it's, it's just that the coal central office revenue down because Singtel is not renting space. So, one of the other types of revenue they have is those central offices where stores a lot of, of, of uh, telco equipment. So those Singtel isn't using so much of them since they have their own. Uh, the main thing to look out for for Netlink will be the regulatory review. So every five years, the authorities will evaluate the prices because you no know, Netlink is virtually a monopoly, uh, but they need to be regulated, especially pricing. So every five years, the last time was 2017. So 2022, the new price should be effective first Gen 23, or maybe there might be a delay, maybe in the middle of January. So uh, our own base case is we think the price will come down, um, mainly because they got more units and so forth. It's a bit of a complicated way to calculate, but uh, no change to our 23 forecast, and it's unlikely to impact dividend payout because uh, they can always the way for business trust this is not a read, but for business trust. The definition of what you can pay as dividends also depends on borrowings and also depends on capex. So there's a bit of root, leg, leg room for them to, to move around on dividends. So we think dividends will more or less be maintained. We still maintain a, a neutral. Uh, what we think is that the modest growth in DPU will actually reduce the attractiveness because everyone buys this as an income yielding investment. But uh, the spread over bond yield, so what we're trying to say is that Although interest rates has been climbing, the dividend yield because the share price hasn't really moved. So the dividend yield is still around 5%. Although interest rates continue to rise, so the spread, that means the additional yield that you're getting hasn't is actually been shrinking. So we just find it that it will be it will lose its appeal as a income interest yielding asset. It's basically like a fixed income bond, like a, like a fixed fixed rate bond. And then when interest rates rise, you of course it becomes less attractive. I mean, that's the whole point of it. Although it's such a long statement. But, uh, next slide. Uh, so for Comfort Delgo, uh, recovery is underway except China. So the first half, uh, revenue was in line again, but I think the earnings was mainly 
below about 35 was mainly because they had to give a 10 million uh, taxi rebate to China due to the lockdown. And, and 10 million is, is uh, huge. I think if you look at the profit for the second quarter, it was 40 million. So 10 million is a big amount. And it and these are pure profit because you no, know, because this is like rental income. Then you don't collect rent, you so you will forfeit the rent, and then in the end you lose ten million that goes straight to the bottom line. So for us, the the positive was that uh, although revenue only rose it uh, rose eighty four million, uh, half of the revenue went to the bottom line. That's why we like it because there's operating leverage. So when there's a recovery coming in, every dollar forty cents of it go to the profit. So because most of the things are all fixed costs. You know when you operate a bus, uh. When you operate a uh, MRT train, the train, the cost is mainly the train. So there's no incremental cost if more passengers go uh, go into the train or bus or taxi. Uh, so an operating profit before you have to strip out quite a bit of things. Uh, the government relief, some of the non-recurring gains and so forth. The the operating profit actually was up 156%. Uh, free cash flow continues to be healthy. They increased their dividend to uh, 2.85 cents. Uh, but again, uh, although it's a great number, but it's still far from the pre-pandemic. Pre-pandemic was 4.5, so there could be room to grow maybe next year. Uh, they also give a special dividend if you look at the table on the left. Uh, this was mainly because of a disposal gain of a London property. So this was one-off, so they just consider it as like a special one-off dividend. Uh, the negative was the lockdown in China. So because of the lockdown in China, they had to give this 10 million. And China suffered a loss from... Uh, 3 million loss from a two mil 3 million gain a year ago. So for Outlook, uh, we it will still be a recovery for second half. For taxi and ride hailing, uh, this is the only data we can get, which is from uh, high frequency data we can get from LTA. So we noticed that the only, it, it was um, up to April, it was still weak, but from May to June, you can see the taxi takings continue to rise. So this is good. And this will also benefit them uh, directly because of the booking fee that they are starting to collect. So if you make a booking through their app, you will, uh, the drivers have to pay. In the past, they didn't uh, from May onwards. Uh, but they will still have the taxi rental rebate. So that will still press on earnings up to uh, uh, September. Then hopefully by fourth quarter, if taxi takings continue, which they did mention kind of like, uh, might, could be even better than pre-pandemic, then there's chance for them to lift this taxi rebate. Then you get a, a jump in earnings. Uh, the only weakness, of course, is that the taxi revenue will be, because the taxi fee continues to fall. I think we saw the data that we showed a couple of weeks ago. It, con it drops about 7%. The other negative is that uh, uh, during the renegotiation from transition from downtown line to NRR, uh, the, new, the new framework, uh, the, 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 because the bus, the bus Contracts have been negotiated lower. So bus contracts in Singapore is you don't take passenger risk. Uh, you're just paid a service fee to just drive around. I'm just drive, 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 drive. Uh, of course, the good thing is you don't take passenger risk, but the 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 the, the you just have to take on the, the services, just make sure that everything's on schedule and so forth. But the government has renegotiated lo lower as part of the whole NRF con uh, deal, which was already mentioned a couple of months ago. So we maintain our buy, uh, no change our target price. The next slide. Our Asian Pay TV. So for Asian Pay TV, again, results was more or less, it was virtually in line with our, met our forecast. And, uh, and also the distribution of 25.25 cents continues uh, and, and the dividend is paid every quarter. Uh, the positive, like in every the last few quarters has been the broadband continue to grow strongly. You can see on the table on the left, it's up 16%. Uh, you get an interesting thing where broadband grow because subscriber rise and price also increase. And so it's very rare, you know, volume also increase, price also increase. And the price increase because uh, most of the subscribers are taking on the higher bandwidth plans. Uh, they also, for the first time, disclose more details on 5G. So 5G is now 1.1 million revenue in first half compared to the whole of last year, 1.6 million. Uh, the negative, as in, the, again, the previous few quarters has been the decline in basic cable. So just a, a, ref, a reminder, the, the cable here is not like uh, our usual cable. Most of it is mainly local content. And most, of, most uh, watch this through the, the, cable, uh, the cable network. So this continues to be the 18th consecutive quarterly decline uh, because of piracy issues and also IPTV. But the key for us has been the broadband has been slowly uh, uh, increasing and, 
and also broadband has a higher margins. So in terms of the outlook, I think this this trend of higher broadband and low cable TV will continue to be low. So uh, while ARPU is 20% lower than cable TV, the margins are higher because there's no content cost. Because content is about 30% of, uh, of cable. So uh, although the revenue be low, but the EBITDA is actually more or less uh, equal between the cable and the broadband. Uh, in terms of uh, our view, we still ma maintain... Uh, Actually, it should be a buy, so it shouldn't be maintained. So, typo, it should be upgraded to a buy. My apologies. Uh, it was a quite a last minute thing. So, because the current dividend yield of uh, 8.5% is we think can be sustained because the payout for this 8.5% dividend yield is uh, 18 million, and we estimate their cash flows of about 80 million. Uh, so, even though interest rates are rising, uh, um, but most of the debt was hedged up to 2025. So even if they do rise, there'll be minimal impact on the on their dividend payout. Uh, next slide. Uh, so for Uni Asia, uh, the, the earnings spike, but do note that uh, for Philip Research uh, receives monetary compensation for the production of this report. So this is a paid research report. Uh, so for the results, uh, the results beat our forecast. It was about 70% of our, of the first half was 70% of full year forecast. Uh, and it was and earnings the first half earnings you know uh jump uh, basically uh, jump more than doubled to from seven to sixteen million as you can see the table on the left, and they also tripled their dividends to six point five cents. So what why they did well is mainly the charter income. If you look on the table on the left, uh, most of it because charter rates went up almost eighty percent year on year, and also the margins expanded uh, because they don't take on fuel costs. Fuel costs is Bond by the company. Oh, sorry, just to remind everyone, uh, charter refers to the 10 bulk vessel ships they own. Uh, bulk vessels, uh, unlike containers, they are the ones that carry uh, grain, coal, anything not containerized. I mean, just think of it. Um, a lot of it goes to China, of course, uh, iron ore and so forth. Uh, so the only increase in cost was vessel operating costs, and that was mainly because of crew salary, crew logistics, because these days, because of the pandemic, you, know, you still have to fly them around and so forth. Maybe less so now. Uh, free cash flow has tripled to, to 20 million because of good results and so forth. Uh, the negative is that uh, another key part of the business, if you look at the table on the left, the PBT, the 1.947 million, uh, is also selling properties in, in Japan. So they will build this alero, like small residential blocks, uh, maybe three, four story, just a couple of units, in it, and then they will buy, lease it, and then once there's a tenant, they will sell it. But when we look at the pipeline, it is coming down. So in the first half, they sold two. That's why the earnings was up. But the pipeline of projects is down from eight a year ago to the uh, down to eight. Sorry, from thirteen a year ago. So what it means is that the there will be fewer units to sell in the near term because in part is also because uh there's a bit more aggressive bidding for land in, in Japan. So in terms of the outlook, uh we didn't raise our numbers because we will show you a chart later that the the Baltic Exchange Handy Size Index started to roll. So this is the this index actually will benchmark the, uh, the charter rates. So charter rates were strong up to June, but from June onwards, charter rates started to drop. Uh, we, we still think medium term uh, is still positive uh, because the new orders. So this is about a supply. You no know, demand is always difficult to forecast, but uh, what we think is supply is very constrained for bulk ships. Uh, New orders is the 30 year low. That means the amount of ships being ordered, that means new vessels, i.e., supply is like 30 year or 30 year lows. So, very tight supply right now, uh, mainly because the capacity is filled with container. Uh, I mean, the shipyard, like Yang Jijang, rather just build a container bigger, more margin, and so forth, rather than build a bulk ship. Also, there's port congestion. So, all these are kind of like, we kind of term it as hidden supply because some of these ships are stuck in the ports rather than being used. And another one is slow steaming because of high fuel cost and so forth. So in, in terms of it, uh, we are maintaining our numbers and then uh, the only near-term concern is that the handy side index dropped July and August to uh, to below the first half. So if this continues, then of course the earnings will be weaker compared to the first half. Uh, next slide. Um, so you can see from this table, uh, these are basically the charter rates. If you focus on the blue line, which is 2022, so from Jan to May, you can see that the blue line is higher than the beige line, which is 2021 20, rates. But then from June onwards, you can see that the rates have come off. So, so this will mean that the second half will be weaker than the first half, but and also even weaker than 
than 2021 because it's below the page line. So that's why we didn't move our forecast. Uh, next slide. So move on to our quarterly uh, update. Uh, so for the key macro for Singapore, uh, SIA passengers carry continues to be spectacular. I think uh, year on year, the number of passengers that SIA carry was 10 times higher. It's quite amazing how they manage it. But it used to be 100, many how it used to be 100,000, now 1.5 million, you can still manage it. Uh, it's still, uh, about 23% below the pre-pandemic, 1.9. Export numbers continue to be, to be stable. Uh, for residential new launches in Singapore, uh, there were only 834 units sold in July, um, which is a 50% year-on-year drop. So this means that as we move into the second, uh, to the third quarter, the real estate agent numbers also should still be a bit weak. We, because, the, like I said, there's not enough new launches to sell. Uh, and year to date is about down 45. So, this year you're looking at probably 8, 9,000 units. So, whereas last year you're talking about 12, 13,000. So, you would expect a big drop. Uh, in the US, the retail sales data is, is still very strong. Uh, fastest growth in five months. And, and do note that in the US, retail sales used to be 3, 4%. So, right now it's growing three to four times faster. Um, in the Fed minutes, it was they actually was a bit positive because they said that it might be appropriate to slow down the pace of policy rate, uh, and that and uh and also, but the problem was that uh, when on you know, I think on Friday in the Wall Street Journal interview, I think one of the FOMC members mentioned that uh, they don't want to drag the interest rates into next year, and then he might be looking at even seventy five basis points. So he's important because he's part of the FOMC voting members. Uh, uh, and, okay, so in terms of our tactical view, we still think that it will be a so-called soft landing rally uh, team because the way things are moving, the, we, are, we could be poised for a soft landing because uh, retail sales unemployment is still healthy and even though the, the Fed has raised rates, although we all know there's a lag, but it seems to be there's no real crash in the economy right now. But it took a breather because of the Fed official comments that we just mentioned. Uh, we still think that uh, uh, actually uh, interest rates will climb and then inflation will not peak but roll, but also, uh, sorry, interest rates will climb but it will not roll over and I think interest rates will just plateau uh, uh, and it will stay higher for longer. That's what our base case for interest rates. Huh? So the Monte will also be one of the beneficiaries. I mean, if you still retail, US retail sales remain to be uh, very vibrant. Uh, in terms of the webinars we have, uh, we have uh, tomorrow, the next, uh, yeah, we have uh, 23rd, 24th. These are some of the small caps in Singapore. Uh, Unity Software is a US company. Some of the new additions to our webinar include Comfort and Halcyon. Uh, next slide. So I'll just run through two last ones, which is uh, UMS and Marco Polo Marine. So for UMS, uh, in case some who may not know, so what they do is front end equipment. Uh, one of their main customers is supposedly uh, applied materials. Um, so the pet me was up nineteen percent, but what dragged them down? If you look at the table on the on the right, is the income tax. So income tax was up, was doubled, although no profit, only up twenty two percent, because they couldn't get the uh, pioneer status tax allowance. Uh, the other key thing is that. Uh, their commentary has been like, no, demand is still more than supply. The other thing is that the new customer, they have a new plan in Penang, which is on a schedule. Uh, and the size of this is 60% of the current 500,000 square feet that they have across the whole group. Uh, the tax will be higher, but there are still ongoing discussions with Maida, hopefully to, 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 kind of, uh, to kind of reduce their tax again. So for JEP, maybe next aerospace will be a big recovery team for them next year. Uh, the cost is coming down. Uh, okay, I'll just move on to the outlook. So I think uh, the outlook for the company looks uh, looks good. In fact, could be very good because uh, there are several share price catalysts. Firstly, uh, although semiconductor might be weak, but for them, they're more uh, by the uh, they're more dependent on wave, on equipment and wafer fat investments. As we know, there's a lot of wafer fats being built in the US and of course China. So this will all benefit them. And even Singapore also having one or two wafer firms. So all this is going to be to, to be remain re resilient. That's why I guess they say demand is outpacing supply. Uh, then you get this new customer coming up. Uh, I think one way to gauge how big this new customer can be is the size of the new plant, which 
uh, which knowing the, the CEO you know, you're not going to build, come bring, take on all these costs if there's no incremental revenue. So the size of it is 60%. So you, I mean, very simplistically, you could assume that the new business is as much as 60%. Of, so there could be a 60% jump just from this new customer. Again, just a possibility. This is just the size. Uh, and the other share cat catalyst is uh, lower tax provision. Of, of course, uh, it can only be good because they've already taken into account the higher tax. It can only be good news. I mean, they are appealing it and hopefully they can get a favorable decision from the Malaysian tax authorities. Uh, next slide. So this is my uh, last slide. So for Marco Polo Marine, they do OSV ship chartering. Uh, OSV basically means it's mainly AHTS, which was very uh, popular popular team until 2016. So these are basically oil and gas vessels. Uh, you know, when have, you have a rig out uh, offshore you know, to drill all, you need an AHTS to bring supplies, to bring crew. Uh, it's like the work boat, uh, no? and also to, to, move, uh, to move some of the rigs and so forth. So every rig, you, maybe you need at least like one or you need at least two AHTS. Uh, they also do shipbuilding and repair in, in, uh, in Indonesia. Top and Bush is very small. Uh, so, in the, so if you look at their update, the gross profit tripled to almost 9.7 million. We estimate that maybe they are making like 3 to 4 million this quarter. Um, chartering has been, done, has been doing well. So one of the key business you can see from the, from the, on the right, ship chartering. So uh, because the, the prices are rising from 60 cents to 70, 80 cents, Thailand, Malaysia is all picking up and even Middle East is picking up because I guess all price is up. Uh, the other thing that's helping the chartering is there's also a lot of demand for offshore wind farm. Uh, ship repairs is also doing well for them, the other key business. Uh, because of the China lockdown, a lot of the ships are instead of going to China, which is supposed to be cheaper, they are coming to, to their yard. And it, just to give you a sense of the demand, it used to be, you know, the ships will have one month in advance. They will tell you, I'm, I'm bringing my ship one month in advance, but now it's moved up to even three months because the demand is so strong. Uh, and they are coming back because they realize you no, know, the the their yard in Batam has good price and the quality too. Uh, and also there's huge, most of the demand if you it's all container ships uh, because container doing so well they can repair anything they want. Uh, so so most of it is container ships that's providing all this demand. Uh, the next key driver would be shipbuilding, but of course there's no orders yet. And they're also looking at this uh thing called CSOV. Uh, it's a very it's a big vessel uh, that. Is in shortage and it could be very useful. If, but of course, you need to get funding too. But, but this is another uh, share price driver. I mean, if they can get this thing off the ground, so in terms of the outlook, the outlook is uh, positive for them. Um, most of the divisions are doing well, so repair remains strong. Uh, the only little uncertainty is that you know, if China reopens or whether customers will actually go back to China. I mean, that one uh, is still debatable. Uh, but chartering is going to do well. So why chartering is doing well is because uh, demand is not coming only just from oil and gas, but it's also coming from offshore wind. This is a new demand. Uh, used to be, you know, all this AHTS only used for oil and gas, but right now, uh, uh, offshore demand, because everyone needs to install offshore wind, you know, those big, those big wind, uh, wind turbines, you know, those big... Uh, yeah, so they want to build it offshore, so you you can't bring a normal ship. You, know? you need all these vessels to help carry the equipment, to carry the people, to help do the installation. Uh, they think my last point is that they think twenty twenty four could be an even better year because Japan and Korea will be building out a lot of wind farms then. Uh, because it takes time, right? You need to order, you need to build the 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 wind turbine. Then by twenty twenty four is when the installation begins. So they think at that time the demand will be even stronger. At least according to. You know, to, of course, it's not a forecast, it's just according to the schedule and so forth. Okay, uh, that's it from us. I think we can move on to q &A. Uh, Max, you want to talk about uh, C? And can you just explain a little bit on like, uh, like C, like what makes profit, what doesn't make? Uh, uh yeah so sure uh for c the arena which is the gaming section uh, uh took a decline in the user base so uh and also this is also because the quarterly paying user is 
also drop in case you missed the point during the presentation just now. And therefore, uh, and there's, they also have a very limited number of games uh, down their pipeline. So that is the outlook for C in terms of ga uh, the gaming uh, con uh, in the gaming sector. But if you want to know more about this, uh, since Jonathan, the analyst who is covering this, uh, the, this stock, is unavailable today, you can send us an email and he will attend to your question if you require more detail. Yeah, okay. Uh, just to give you a recap, uh, Jonathan is in a, in a, having, a sem uh, having training. So for, for C, uh, most of the profit comes from Garena. Uh, they are free fire, is it? Uh, Max, the name of the game. So yeah, most yeah, of the Free profit Fire. has come has uh, has come from that, and with the profits and cash flow from this game, they they are using it to you know do to to invest in Shopee, and shop uh, and Shopee Shopee money, yeah. uh, but that's small uh, I mean, money. That's, yeah, C money. Yeah, uh, that's small. That's like more like noise than anything else. But the problem right now is that uh the game is weak. Is has been, has turned around. Has been weaker, and the and of course Shopee has been growing, but Shopee is burning a lot of cash. So, so that that is the whole uh, issue right now, right, Max? Yeah. Yep. But the Shopee segment is uh is poised to turn to have adjusted EBITDA break even by the end of the year. Yeah. Okay. Because yep. the so, adjusted EBITDA loss is very min uh, minor at this first half. Yeah. Okay. So, so like what Max said. So the key is whether you no know, the Shopee can turn around to you know, because nowadays nobody can take losses, right? Because this like uh, loss making internet companies, nobody really is going to downgrade you. In the past, nobody mind if you lost money, but now it matters. Uh, so the key is to monitor whether Shopee can turn around. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Max. Yeah. Sorry for uh, the very poor reply from me. Just that uh, Jonathan is not not in his uh, away, and he's the one who covers. Uh, what counters should one look from the NDP rally speech? Uh, I think Terence can add more, but ultimately it's just construction. Uh, I think all the pictures you see there need more BRC steel and maybe need more Pan United uh, cement. That's why uh, we think construction will stay elevated because you got all these mega projects. It used to be construction was very volatile, uh, swing up and down. But we think with all this uh, long team investment infrastructure, it will keep in construction activity elevated. Uh, we don't favor construction companies. Um, partly because the capabilities of construction companies are, to be fair and to be you know, transparent about it, they are not really the, the they don't do really high end. Like what is the longest road? We always joke, what's the longest road in Singapore? Maybe 40 kilometers compared to Malaysia and a couple of hundred. So the capabilities of uh, construction companies in Singapore isn't the, uh, that's why they cannot earn the high margins and a lot of it is done by the foreign contractors and it's very competitive. This, this wasn't quoted by us, actually quoted by the construction companies themselves. So, so we, we prefer building materials uh, like, uh, like what Terence covers, like BLC and Pen United. Uh, anything, uh, Terence, do you got anything else you want to? Oh. Uh, no, Paul, you, you put it right. Yeah, nothing else. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Terence. Yeah. So, but if you want more details, I mean, Terence knows them much, much better than me. Yeah. Uh, so next question, uh, has Yang Chichang hit bottom? Uh, has T Rose Price finished their selling? Is it time to? I don't think they finished their selling. I think, from what we understand, uh, T Rose Price is selling because they, 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 are, they want to buy a shipbuilding. The way the funds are structured, they are buying. They want a shipbuilding company, not a finance company. So, if you look at the announcements, you can see that they have been selling from Yang Chichang Financial, but buying Yang Chichang Shipbuilding. So I think there's this allocation of money there. So I don't think their, their selling is done. Whether hit rock bottom, uh, it's, it's more, or less, more or less in line it, with the Chinese banks, about, about four times book. So it really depends uh, on, on your outlook for China. I mean, if to, suddenly tomorrow everyone re-rates China in 12 months time, then maybe this stock can run. Yeah. It's a more China view, sorry, I don't really, but for me at this juncture, I don't see anything attractive. I can just buy, like I said, you can just buy a Chinese bank, 0.4 times book, the dividend yield so bet is even better. And no matter what, it's still a Chinese bank, right? State-owned bank. So these are just my own limited uh, thoughts. Uh, that's why if you look at the announcements, the, the T-Rose is actually buying 
probably they sell the financial and then buy shipbuilding. But at least Yang Zhejiang has been buying back a lot of shares recently. So maybe that's helping to support. Uh, Paul, for the KN Dental, will he face issue of writing off his goodwill and acumen? What would be the impact? Uh, actually, for us, uh, for us analysts, uh, the goodwill uh, doesn't they have a lot of goodwill? I, I don't even if they do write off, uh, we normally consider it as just a one off. It might, of course, affect the book value, but the NTA doesn't get affected. And, and for us, uh, more important is the earnings capability rather than, than whether they write off. For us, it's just a one off. We will hardly, uh, it will not impact the, the, the company much. My own thoughts are because it's not, it's not a cash item and, 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 and so forth. And I'm not sure how much is left the goodwill because they did earn a lot of profit from it. So although there's goodwill, but then you know, when you, you earn your, the level of associates, oh, sorry, it's a subsidiary, not associates, sorry. Yeah, yeah, there is still goodwill, I apologize. Yeah, but it won't impact even if they do make a write-off on, on cash flow and so forth. Uh, what catalyst does IFAS have and why the recent movements? Uh, okay, Glenn can't help to answer because I think he's gone off for a flight. Um, I don't think there's any particular, maybe the results was better than expected, uh, but the real, the real, the main event for them will be next year uh, when they, when the Hong Kong project, and they always remind us that when they said, when they give the profit guidance, it's always, um, the, it's like the minimum, uh, it's the minimum, they said, just remember, this is the minimum amount of profit they can get, so it could be much, much more than that. Because normally you have a buffer, right? So I think the share price will probably move more likely next year because right now they are they have to the earnings will fall because a lot of it is the transaction like all no the, there were more transactions last year than this year so all these transaction income related earnings will drop then the bounce will come back next year yeah but the earnings will be really good I think uh, from their Hong Kong project because it would be I forgot the exact numbers so don't quote me but it's in one of their slides so it's more a next year story than than now. But I'm not sure why the recent movements. I didn't really. Okay. Uh, is Great Eastern buy or sell? Uh, is the dividend comparable with Singapore banks? I, from what I just checked, I think the Great Eastern dividend yield is about three point something. Uh, so the bank's dividend yield is much better. Uh, we 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 don't cover Great Eastern. Yeah. But the yield is, is lower than the banks. So their yield now I think is about three point six versus the banks might be around four. Yeah. So slightly lower. He, um, hi, on the residential new launches, are the figures including HDB? Oh, oh no, no, no. Uh, HDB is uh, totally BTO. We also don't take uh, EC when we do new launch because, because EC can be lumpy, then it might kind of make the number. Because EC, maybe one last year don't have, then this month there is, then it, makes the, it will make the numbers suddenly spike up. So we don't include EC, we don't include HDB because HDB is BTO, right? So it, 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 it yeah, it's, uh, maybe I should put, be more specific, it's private residential new launches, yeah. Okay. Uh, will there be a guest presentation by Marathon? Uh, yes, there is. Uh, I, I think it has been pushed back. Um, can, can someone check when is the date? For, because they, they changed the date for us. Yeah. Uh, marathon will be on the 26th of August. Uh, it wasn't our course. I mean, they, they, they changed the date. So that's why we had to reschedule. It's on the 26th of, 26th of August. So this Friday, 10 a.m. Marathon. Oh, I, well, maybe I didn't put. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Can, can someone take some of the other questions? Yeah. Uh, hi. hi, I'll take the question on the escort placement shares. So with the listing of escort placement shares cause any price pressure? Yes, so the answer is definitely because uh, the placement price is at 1.12 and then uh, before the announcement, it was about 1.18. So as you can see, the market as well, they priced, kind of priced in this uh, new placement issue of 170 million, which is about 5% of their float. So yes, near term, there will be definitely be some price pressure, especially when the shares start listing in two days' time. But overall, because uh, this placement was done to a, 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 so I a proposed acquisition of some properties to in their longer stay segment, it will, and it's a 2.8% accretive. So it's a good uh, acquisition as well. So longer term, not so much. It's only the near term price pressure. 
kind of thing. Uh, Zane, you want to do the TA first, then I will. You, you can share screen yeah. if you want. Yeah, if you yeah, want, you can sure. just share screen. Thanks. Okay, so I'll take the TA question for Yang Zijiang first. So for this, uh, it's in a generally it's in an uptrend. Uh, recently it broke down of broke out. Sorry, I broke out of this uh downtrend resistance line, and then the it tested this resistance at nine seven five to nine eight five like twice here, and we also have this uh uptrend uh support line holding it. So I think the gen. Um, the support for now is around nine, ninety three cents uh, around here, and resistance is around ninety eight cents over here. Overall, might be forming a ascending triangle. Uh, afterwards, if it breaks out, then it could hit to around one. The we test the previous high over here, one zero two, one zero three. Yeah. Uh, next counter, uh, Silver Lake. Looks a bit like a range bound for now. Uh, resistance was formed at uh, around 44 cents top over here. Then it broke down this support at uh, 40, 42 cents. Then it went back up to retest the resistance and it came back down again. So the support now is around at uh, 39 cents to 40, 40 cents. Resistance being uh, here 42 cents. 42 cents to 43 cents. Then uh, if this support doesn't hold right, then we might come back down to this uh, lower support region over here, around 36 to 37.5 cents. But mostly it looks for probably like a range bound pattern for now. Uh, next one will be uh, Samudera shipping. Uh, recently, after a strong move upwards, uh, it has come down to do a uh, double bottom over here at around 94 to 96 cents. Yeah, so now the short term resistance is around 105 to 110 over here. Then uh, support is over 94 to 96, 97 cents. Then uh, further up, the resistance could be around here, around 115 to 118, yeah. Then if it comes, if it breaks this support right, then it could come down to around eighty two cents to uh eighty eight cents this region over here. Yeah. Okay, so I will see if there are other TA questions. Okay, I see a question on the uh, Wilma. Okay, uh, Wilma generally looks like a. Uh, downtrend but then uh, the, the support is over here is it has been holding it for a very long time uh, around four dollars to uh, four ten but you see the highs have been forming a lower lower high over here recently the resistance is over here uh, after the earnings it went to four twenty twenties to around four thirties yeah that's the reasons then the support for now is Four to four ten. Then further up, the another resistance could be at four fifty to four seventy over here. Yeah, but it looks possibly like it could move in a range for now. Before, if it breaks any of these key zones, then we'll see uh, another move. Okay, um, I see a question on a uh, UMS also. <laughs> so, uh, looks not bad. Uh. Recently, it broke out of this uh, downtrend pattern. Then uh, it went all the way up to currently is at uh, uh, intermediate supply zone around 130 to 135 over here. Then if it goes further up, then it could go to 140s to 143. Yeah, but the chart still looks good. Uh, could be a reversal, probably a reversal from a downtrend back towards the uptrend. Yeah. Okay, uh, another question will be uh, Sing Xiong. 
pay for this uh looks like it hit a uh, supply region recently over here at 162 to 168 yeah then uh the support is the support should be around here around uh on fifth one fifty four to uh one fifty six around here yeah but what we could possibly see it come back down to retest this support region over here given that it has hit the supply region but if it continues to move further up then it could hit around one sixty eight. Uh, next one is on uh, Yang Zhijiang Financial. So the chart wise is looking uh bearish. It broke down of this uh descending triangle. Uh, then also broke down of a key level at uh, thirty nine cents over here. Then uh, but recently after the downward move, it could come back up to retest this uh prior support and resistance zone. Then uh, we see whether it. It can move back up or continue to be rejected off this uh, key level, but overall it's still in a down downtrend. Okay, Jardin, uh, mm, it overall is in an uptrend. You can see over here. But uh, recently it's come to this uh, resistance zone around uh, $32 to uh, 30, $33 around here. Yeah. But uh, further up, the next resistance could be at uh, here. This is the 36 dollars to 38 dollars here. Then short term wise, the support is around here, which is uh twenty six to twenty eight dollars, but is it could be a uh, forming a double top, or as if we test the swing high over here, so could be some price pressure to move downwards again, could be forming a range uh. yeah. Okay, QNM Dental. Uh, downtrend this year. Uh, lower highs and lower lows, but uh, coming close to this uh, support region over here, which is around uh thirty seven cents to thirty nine cents. Yeah, recently we have a strong uh bearish movement downwards. So. And the resistance zone is uh could be this uh this range that we broke down from is on forty uh over five to uh four five five yeah okay uh comfort delta. Mm, looks like in a big range pattern actually. You can see over here and the support is over here. So resistance is around uh, 147 to around 153 so over here. And you can see the support is at uh, 130, 133 to 137. So looks like it's forming a big range bound pattern over here. Okay, uh Genting first could could be forming a triple bottom bullish pattern upwards, but then uh at the same time there was a we broke down of a falling wedge pattern. A, sorry, a rising wedge pattern over here. So uh, it will be important to see whether 765 can hold over here in the previous swing low. 
for the move to continue higher or we will just come back down. The recent is around 82 cents to uh, 84 cents over here. Uh, Franken, I've uh, covered just now. Uh, so it's a possible downtrend reversal. Yeah, you can see a higher, higher highs and a higher low thing form over here after a double bottom at one one o six over here. So yeah, let's see whether I can move back up to this zone at uh, 143, uh, 154. And uh, the next reason zone is around here. Around 170 to 180. Yeah. Uh, AEM, uh, recently also like challenging this downtrend resistance line. Uh, after results, it just keep on uh, hanging around over here. But you can see a series of uh, bullish patterns. I think as long as uh, 450 here continues to hold, right, then we could see an uh, upwards movement towards this region. So around 480s to around near $5. Yeah. Looking not too bad, actually. Oh, okay, Zin, we'll let you take a break <laughs> if you want. Oh, you want to okay. take one more? Or, oh, yeah. uh, I think it's okay. I think it's the last question. Okay, okay. okay. So, uh, DBS. The so, bit of a uh, downtrend, you can see like lower highs, lower highs and lower low form over here. Lower highs and then, uh, have a low here and lower low over here, but so resistance could be around here, around thirty three dollars. Uh, trend line resistance and also uh, this this swing high over here, thirty three point five. Yeah, then the short term support is around here at uh close twenty nine point five to thirty dollars. Yeah. Okay, uh, UOB also similar, uh, lower highs coming in and lower lows. So, uh, the recent zone is around uh, $28 to $28.40 over here. Then, uh, the support zone is uh, here and around around uh, $26 to $26. 30, 20, 40 hours here. Yeah. So I think uh that's all. Thanks. It thanks Dean for picking so many is very good. Yeah. Um okay, we let's try to clear the, the rest then we can we can try to finish it off by 1245. Uh so hi Paul, is the Fed funds rate projected to hit 3.25, 3.5 by December? Uh will the 10 years SGS year rise in tandem? Uh yeah, I I I think it should. I think if you're gonna expect the Fed to raise rates by another hundred basis points, it, it will have some impact on the long term bond yields. Uh, the only caveat is unless people really think there's a big recession coming up, then you get this really really steep inversion. But it's uh, right now there there is an inversion actually, but it's quite minor right now. So we still think um the Fed funds we still think that uh bond yields will will still rise. What's the view on Vilma fundamental and technical? So thanks to Zane, we got the technical part. Uh, so for for Vilma, we think fundamentally it's it will still be healthy because from the three key divisions, uh, Adiba all will still do well because now that palm oil prices are coming off and they have the higher prices, uh, Adiba all, all means the cooking oil in China that we think will still do well. Crushing is also will do well too because hot prices have started to climb back up. It's just that the plantation might be a bit weak and also processing margins, that one's always a bit a, a bit tricky to, 
to forecast uh, because it depends on the ability to time. But I think two of their three key divisions should be performing well. So I think fundamental is still okay. Uh, in, your, in your view, for Refers Medical Group, is the profit level achieved in the first half sustainable? I don't. I, I think it will not be sustainable, but it will be just a slight drop because the first half was exceptionally good. They had COVID-19 uh, business from their, I wouldn't say business, uh, they had patients in their COVID treatment facility. Uh, so although they lost PCR, but they had COVID treatment too. So they had both COVID-19 related revenue and also foreign um, and also medical tourists, number two. And number three, they also had a lot of, uh, of patients coming back to GP clinics in Singapore. So they had virtually all the segments was doing well. But I think as we move into second half, the COVID will, will, come to, will come to trickle down more. So we don't think it is uh, uh, achievable, but it will still be, but it's still considered still very strong uh, considering uh, that COVID was so huge, such a big part of the earnings last year. So still be resilient, I mean, in, in a way. Yeah. But it, it, it's, it's just that uh, the COVID will, will tell to whittle down in the second half. Do you like Q&M? Uh, do you like Q&M slowing down after? Uh, do you think it's growing? Uh, okay, and for Q&M, we think um, this, year, this year, the earnings will be, year on year, the earnings will be weaker because you don't have the COVID-19 and you've got to take on all these upfront costs. So yeah, so the earnings will be weak, weaker this year, but it will recover. We think hopefully stronger by next year, yeah. because by then most of the clinics will mature. Then they can contribute better to the bottom line, uh, rather than now, because there'll probably be a drag on earnings for now. Uh, for Propnex and Apex Realty, have their current share price priced in the declining transaction volumes? Is the market? I mean, you can say they have been pricing because most of the analysts already kind of, or the market already factor in. I mean, it's not new news that volume's coming down. Uh, PropNex already guided. But the thing is just that uh, there won't be any uh, earnings momentum or share price momentum. You know, usually if earnings is weak, the share price doesn't really move much. But whether it's pricing, yeah, I think it definitely pricing. I think even PropNex has already kind of uh, forecasted and guided everyone that volumes will be down 30-40%. So like you said, uh, volumes coming down is not new news, but just that there is no earnings momentum. Uh, they will still pay the dividend yield about 5%. So just that. So that will be the, the thing that can help maybe the share price, I guess. Uh, please share about your Singsiong outlook and its TA. So for Singsiong, uh, second half it will be weaker. I think you can see supermarket sales, grocery sales in July has really started to contract. So we think the, uh, the revenue will be softer, but in the background, they are they are at least beginning to build back up their their number of uh of so the number of stores. I think in our last meeting, don't I mean sorry, don't hold me to the number. They have about sixty plus stores, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, their competitors as as much as two hundred. So, I think the if they they can easily uh increase the number of stores by another fifty percent. Of course, it takes time. I can't do it overnight, but. But I think the outlook is still good in the medium term because they, they can, there's opportunity to build more stores. But just that, uh, or supermarkets, I mean, sorry, not stores. But, yeah. but just that it will, it, right now in the near term, because last year was COVID, right? So most, more people were dining at home. This year, there'll be less. So it will affect grocery sales. What I mean, do you think Q&M is slowing down after COVID-19? Yes, yes. I, uh, so this uh, again, just to reiterate, this year, QM is hit by COVID-19 and also hit by upfront costs. What's your view on Parkway Read and health and healthcare in general? Yeah, yeah, sorry I took this question so late. Um Parkway Read, I'm not very sure. I'm not sure if Darren can help, but uh, uh but for healthcare in, in healthcare, of course, it's going thematically healthcare is, is a very strong team. I mean, you know, we've got uh, aging and so forth. Um I was actually pleasantly surprised that uh, Raffles Medical did, did well, considering that you no know, Raffles Medical, they are still facing losses in China. So the earnings, in a way, is also still being pressed down by the China operations. So I, I think if you want to play the long game in healthcare, uh, apart from QNM, because they're going to play the other, but if you want to play the big, broader healthcare, uh, Raffles Medical will be the one, I think, because they are at least investing in China. So that can be the next growth driver for them. Of course, you know, when you start a new hospital in China, it takes at least two to three years of, of losses if you're lucky. Of loss, if you're lucky, after three years, you'll break even. But 
they are willing to invest in that. And that would be the longer term growth driver. And I think eventually, I think my own guess is that Raffles Medical will definitely be taken over. I mean, you look at the one in Ramsey, remember we showed before, uh, those who, uh, Ramsey Healthcare was taken over recently, I think maybe last month or the month, uh, I think 40 times PE or some or along that sort. So, so, so my thoughts is that the high value, the eventually someone will just make an offer for Raffles Medical. Considering now if they if they manage to to build, to kind of, uh, to, to kind of solve the Rubik's Cube of running a hospital in China profitably. And I think if you do healthcare in China, my own guess is that that's probably one area the authorities will want to intervene more. So I guess if you're doing other sectors, maybe you, there's a risk of government intervention, but maybe healthcare, there might be less. Yeah. Less risk, I guess. Yeah. Okay, let me run through the last few, then we go back to the TA. Uh, how do you compare AEM and UMS? So UMS is more applied materials and AEM is more Intel. Uh, but uh, AEM, you can say, is a bit higher end in terms of the capabilities because they are building their own branded product, uh, which is a system-level test product. Uh, so that was one way to... But both are very front-end centric uh, and with different customer base. But just that for UMS, I just like the visibility because I already know there's a new big customer coming, uh, which uh, for AEM... Uh, they are working on one or two new customers, but they, they weren't very clear. Uh, one of the reasons maybe why the share price might have been moving sideways is also because uh, their guidance, uh, although they raised the guidance, but it's like, maybe it wasn't as high as people thought because it's like right, roughly one year of revenue and so forth. The reason why we don't really speak much more, because I really is such a complicated product, I really no idea how to explain their product. So that's why I don't really go into details for EM. Uh, what's your any views on shipping or related counters? Thanks. Uh, for me, I, I thought I, I thought Marco Polo looked uh, very good because it's also like a shipping. Uh, because it, it, after 2016, right, uh, you know, the most of the competitors either went bus, <laughs> I mean, went bus, or nobody's going to order uh, OSV or a, AHTS that they have, or they have, I think, 13, I think. And in the last few years, I think China bought up mopped up most of the AHTS because they were also doing their own wind shot. So supply is very thin now for AHTS. I guess no no bank was going to finance you if you build like AHTS too right? anyway. So I think the, the demand supply looks very good for their AHTS for them. And they can benefit in both two ways because they have a fleet. And if customers want to order, they can also build. So uh, they are, I guess they're one of the last surviving ones uh, after many rounds of refinancing. So I thought that segment of shipping look uh, attractive uh, compared to uh, containers, especially you know, containers really had a bull run. Uh, so yeah, you, and, and this one seems to be like, right now the rates for HTS maybe 80 cents per horsepower. At the peak was as much as $2, $2.50. Uh, so again, we're not saying it will hit the peak, but yes, you can see that there is room to, to run if things get very tight. Uh. So I thought the, uh, it, for shipping AHTS uh, or OSVs will be better, like those in Marco Polo. Yeah. What are your views on hourglass and general retail outlook? Or the retail in Singapore is like fabulous, I think. Retail sales is growing about 12% in Singapore. Uh, Pre-pandemic, Singapore retail was really sluggish, only 1% growth. So I mean, you can say retail now is 10 times faster than pre-pandemic. Uh, uh, whether it can sustain, I'm not too sure, but... Even if it slows down to five or six, it's still very strong. So retail spend is exceptionally strong in Singapore, especially uh, watches. I think watches, if you look at the data, is growing about 30-40%. I have no idea who's buying all these watches, but that's the date, what the data show. Uh, any view on Samudra? Uh, Samudra, I'm just a bit more hesitant because con container already done such a huge run, right? Uh, and all these stocks usually, because container price... The rates maybe four thousand to twelve thousand or so, uh, per con. I think the 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 rates to move a container, uh, and you know all these share prices. If the if the price doesn't break a new high, then all these shares will just be like moving sideways again. Likewise for plantation. Yeah. Again, this is just my own limited price action view. Yeah, take it for, for what is worth. Um. Okay. Uh. Uh, what's your view on Tarsin? Um, I'm not sure. Um, 
Darren, if you got anything to for Tassin. Uh yeah. Actually for Tassin we do not cover, but then uh looking at their results, uh the retail sales in China is not looking too good. And then uh there are numbers like their NPI and their DPU also dropped this first half. So going forward it's also a struggle for the retail sales in China. So the outlook for me for Tassin per se is not, not too good. Yeah. Thank, thank, thanks for that. Uh, did they say anything about the financing? Did they say about the... Uh, so, so... I don't want, I need to go deeper. To, to okay, see. sure. Yeah. Okay, sure. Thanks. Thanks, Darren. Okay. Uh, uh, which China banks are listed on uh, on SGX? Which ETF include? Yeah, um, I'm not sure which banks are... Maybe any China ETF will have a bank, but I'm, I'm not sure... I know there's if you uh, for me I'm just googling just like anyone else. Uh, there are some China ETFs, but uh, again, to apologize. I don't not uh, don't really familiar with China ETFs. Yeah, sorry for that. What's the thing on the entire US Hong Kong gaming industry as a whole for the rest of the year? Wow, I don't have really. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I don't have any. Uh, don't know how know how to answer that. Yeah, uh, I uh, I'm not sure if you're casino gaming or I guess you're talking about casino gaming. Yeah, really, sir. Sorry, I don't have an answer for that. I don't monitor the data. I don't have much thing to add. Sorry for that. Uh, hi, Paul. Is the China property market look precariously risky and possible cor big correction? Yeah, I, I think they really did the correction. I think uh, from, from our contrarian view is that uh, they cannot let this thing collapse because uh, all the Chinese people, all their collateral is with, uh, with, in property. Uh. So it's really collapsed. I mean, the largest, I think the top two or three developers really went kind of went bankrupt. Or, or the, the only ones to buy, that's why we still think property, I mean, for us, it's a pure contrarian thematic bet in here because uh, we think that they cannot, uh, it's, uh, firstly, sentiment is really so bad. Uh, so many developers are defaulted or even going to bankruptcy. Uh, but we think that some of the cities are starting to relax and remove restrictions to buy property and 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 that's why we think there could be a bounce for them like aside for us we and again this is not a recommendation because we don't cover but things like Yan lot or or even uh Kali, which is the other channel overseas land that's a state-owned property developer because we just think that the sentiment is just so poor and we're just making we're just making a bet that the authorities uh, won't let it collapse because the whole banking system is systemically uh, at, at risk here because all the bank's collateral is property. All the net worth of the Chinese people is a lot of it. I mean, I don't have the number, obviously. Most of the net worth of, of, the, of the Chinese masses are in property. So they, they and they are levers to, and more important, they are levers to, they can actually, of course, lend more, number one. And number two is they can also relax the property restrictions. And just a refresh, no, those are not stamp duty restrictions. This is like they don't allow certain people to buy property. So they can always leave that. Again, this is our own our own bet. I don't have like a report or anything, but this is our own thoughts. Not sure how, how would it work. Um, the, uh, you want to, Terence, you want to talk on KIT? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, and also the ST yeah. engineering like this one. Yeah, thanks, Ter. Oh, okay. Yeah, let me just take the the KIT question first. So for Capital Infrastructure Trust, what, what they have, have done in, in the recent years is they started to shift their business model, what one that is fixed, uh, that pays a fixed uh, dividend payout of 3.72 cents uh, a, a year. So to one that is a core plus model. So what is a a core plus business model. A core plus business model means that in addition to generating fixed uh, distribution payouts that usually come from uh, owning fixed infrastructure assets, what they're going to do is they're going to invest in growth assets as well. So they have a core uh, business that gives them a fixed distribution yield and then uh, the plus is the growth assets that give them the, the deep yield accretion. So if they are successful, then what unit holders will, will see over time is that they will see DPU growth uh, in line with the DPU growth. Uh, 
but obviously with the transition to, to such a, a business model, the risk will naturally be higher also uh, because, the, because you, you have to look for assets that can give you that, that deep fuel equation. So uh, it's, it, it takes time for them to, to be able to grow their DP over time, but overall it's a, a good, um, it's a step in the, uh, the right direction. Uh, the, the thing we'll, we'll watch closely is uh, uh, whether they're able to grow the, the DPU over time. And th there's a question on ST engineering also. I think, but I think that's a TA question, but I'll comment a little bit on ST engineering. Uh, for, S for ST engineering, they've set uh, five-year targets uh, to grow their, their defense uh, business and also grow their, their aerospace business. So the, the, they are, the, the, the key to watch is whether they are able to grow their, their uh, defense segment uh, based on those, those, the targets that they set. So that, that we think is, is, is a positive because in the past they used to just generate a fixed margin uh, and they, they generated a, a fixed amount of dividends every year and then they just pay this out. But what, what the, the, new, the new change will be requires them to be more proactive in growing their both their bottom line and top line. In fact, their revenue and net profit uh, under the, the fire plan, they're supposed to go in tandem uh, about uh, 8 to 9% uh, per annum. So if they're able to pull it off, that would be, it would be good for ST Engineering. Uh, overall, we expect the increase in defense spending in the next uh, few years to, to uh, provide upside for ST Engineering. Yeah, so I think that's all the questions I have on, I'll, I'll hand it back to the rest of my team. Okay, uh, we'll, we will try to take on a few more fundamental questions, then I'll just hand it all back to Zane to, to, to finish it off. Uh, so for Netlink price going down, what are the risks of buying now? I, I think for, for, for me, it's just the, if I'm going to buy an income yielding instrument, I'd rather just buy a REIT for now uh, than buy a, 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 a Netlink. So you can think of Netlink like buying a REIT with a, with a 10 year wheel and, and there's very little increase. So at, at least with a REIT, I know like an escort or whatever, the, the yield might be a bit lower, maybe 4%, probably got the wrong number, but at least I know that the, there's growth. But Netlink, there's no growth. So I, I think that's the worry now. It's like almost, it's like a bond. And that, so do you want to buy a bond or do you want to buy at least a REIT with, I know we're not like big time fans of REIT, but at least there's some growth coming from there. So that's my my only my own thoughts. That's why we have a neutral on it. Yeah. Uh, that are if you want income instrument, maybe something that can at least grow now because interest rates are climbing. Uh, uh Refers Medical, how is it doing with China Hospitals? Uh, yeah, I think the results include uh China Hospital uh, hospitals. Yeah. Uh, the hospitals probably ten. They don't give an exact number, but I think every year they're probably losing 15, 20 million. My own guess, because uh, they said 10 million EBITDA, then you take net profit, probably like 20 million. Yeah, okay. Uh, is DFI out of the woods? So DFI is dairy farm. Uh, okay, you want, you want dairy farm, actually all parts of the business is doing well, but the big problem they have is uh, Yonghui. Uh, Yonghui is a superstore, supermarket in China, which is losing money and losing a lot of market share. So that is the huge problem they have. Uh, I, I really not a China expert. So unless you have a strong view of how whether Yonghui is turning around, so uh, Yonghui is the big problem for dairy, dairy farm. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, with the latest Olam results, do you have any views on Olam? Yeah, I, I need to get back to you because I regretfully have missed their results briefing because there were so many meetings. So I, I will try to talk to them. Hopefully I can get an answer. So apologies for that. Uh, your view on agriculture stock, Golden Agri. Okay, we have a very simplistic view right? because unless you think they're going to break a new high, I think these palm oil stocks will probably at best just trade sideways. Uh, good results don't mean anything because it's already been priced in and everybody knows you got good results because they can see it's very transparent. Uh, palm oil price jump up record high, your profits will definitely be high. So uh, it's your view of just don't think that palm oil price can break a new high. So uh, again, this is a very simplistic view. Right? <laughs> So that's why we're not very big fans of pure plantation names. Okay, I, I think we kind of take on most of it. Uh, uh, how is, okay, last one, how is StarHub a cybersecurity business going and will it add? Okay, uh, we always wanted to add cybersecurity into our value because cybersecurity, you know, the valuations can be, you know, because it's such a hot team, right? But the problem is, is 
uh, it's still loss making and it probably be loss making for some time. Uh, and it uh, you can think of it like it could be a this will be probably another two three years before uh this thing will start to contribute more meaningfully. But it is definitely a hidden asset of which most analysts don't price that in. Uh, whether will they go listing, I really doubt it because cybersecurity, most of their cybersecurity is to government agencies and so forth. So I, I doubt they're ever going to list this thing because too, ma too much sensitive information. But it's definitely a hidden asset like you rightly pointed out. But whether we want to pack a valuation, we, uh, most of us don't. So in a way, it's not, not because we frankly don't know how to do it because it's still, uh, because it's still loss making. We put price to sales, nobody believes us anyway. So, uh, so it's a hidden asset which market doesn't value because most of the market is probably just valuing them like any other telco partner. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, Zane, you want to take over? Okay. Thanks, for. I'll be taking the rest of the QA question. Uh, so, okay, there's a uh, capital DC read. So overall, this one has been a very strong downtrend now, but you see that it's forming a range recently. The, Resistance is around 205 to 208 around here. And the support zone, you can see is around 190 to 195. Uh, so probably it probably moves around sideways for now. Uh, if it breaks down of the support again, then we might see it go down to uh, 175 to 185 region over here. Yeah. So next one, uh, OCBC. Uh, okay, so for this, uh, it's moving around in a sideways trend. Uh, the key reasons around 1230s to uh, 1260 over here. And there's also another uh, reasons over here around 13 to 13.5. Yeah. And uh, the short term support is around $11 to 1140 right? So barring anything, it's also likely to move in a sideways unless it breaks out this recent zone over here and then we might see it cover the gap and test this uh, recent zone again up here. Okay, next one, uh, Keppel Corps. So for this, uh, also it's near the recent zone for now. It has been an, in an uptrend this year. So uh, the key reasons are seven dollars to 7.30 so over here. Yeah. So uh but if the price do, does come down, uh the immediate support will be around 640 to around 650 over here. Yeah. Mm, but it's still looking not too bad in an uptrend. So let's see. Okay, uh Roku, uh let's Okay, so the price basically just collapsed uh, from the highs of 400 plus. So now we are back around 70 plus dollars. The support is around 57 to 68, a $10 range, as you can see from the previous historical range over here. So we might be coming to it again. The resistance is around $100 over here to 115 yeah, but not looking very good. Uh, so it might come back down. The okay, uh, last one will be a uh, credo tech. So uh, this stock recently it made a double top. You can see over here. We test the previous season zone at around 16 to 18. Then we might see it coming back down to test this uh, intermediate support zone at 13 to $14. Yeah. And if it if it comes down again, then we might see it come to um ten dollars to eleven point five over here. Yeah. So that's all from me. Yeah. Okay, wait, okay, I see a last question. Uh ascender. Uh ascender is also like um much for now, I think. Uh, it's currently at this uh, resistance zone around uh, $3, $2.90 to $3 around here. 
and our short term support will be around here at uh, 270s to 280s. Uh. Yeah. And if it if it breaks out of this uh, recent zone, then you might see it go to um, 310 or to 320s around here. Yeah. So uh, that's all from me. Thank, thank you everyone for tuning in and uh, we see you again next week. Yeah. Okay, so th thanks everyone. Uh, and have a good week ahead and, and take care. Bye-bye everyone.